Hi guys, this is CS50's introduction to game development. This is Dread Holes, the uh, tumble update, which uh, focuses around putting holes randomly around the generated dungeon, displaying a game over screen, and from the game over you come back to the title screen. And uh, also putting a text label, I've put it in the bottom corner, just indicating which maze you're currently on, a maze or level. So uh, let's take a look at this. Um, this is the play scene and I'll click the uh, dungeon generator here and I've uh, added a public property here a public variable called holes to spawn and that lets you sort of toggle how many holes you would like in the maze I just set it to 4 so we can sort of actually see them so I'll just uh, change my layout to full screen so we can see it a bit better then uh, we're going to demo the software So the first requirement is the number, uh, well, holes in the floor, I guess. So somewhere in this maze, we have four holes. You can see the text label in the bottom corner indicating we're on level one right now. So there's a hole. There's another one, and uh, there should be two more around here. But uh, let's let's jump down one. So you can see the uh, whisper source, which is the audio, uh, we destroyed that completely, so the uh, sound stops uh, when we're on the game over screen. We press enter, the audio begins for the title, and then we go back into the game. So the last bit I need to demo is finding the pickup and moving to level 2. So. Let's see if we can find that. I may have to skip forward. Okay, uh, we're back. I found the pickup. So once I collect this pickup, we should go to level 2 and restart the maze. So there we go. We're back on level 2. It's randomly generated uh, four more holes for this maze. And again, uh, when I collect the pickup, we'll go to level 3. Okay, so uh, here's one of the holes on uh, level 2 here. Again, the holes are randomly generated for each level, and I've also added some code that our character never spawns over a hole, and also the pickup never spawns over a hole also. Okay, here's the pickup moving us from 2 to 3, and you can see the label's updated to 3, and now we're on level 3. Okay, so we're on level 3 now, we're just going to fall down the hole, get game over, and it should go back to level 1. And there it is. So yeah, thanks for watching, it's uh, been a cool assignment. So let's uh, dive into the code then and see how this all works behind the scenes. So when you download the code from the website, you'll notice that it won't compile. Your, your console here in Unity will have a few errors here about some obsolete objects in the scripts. Well, it's uh, really easy to remedy. Uh, we're, we're on almost October 2020 right now, so there might be more coming later. Uh, there's, there was quite a lot of warnings as well. But to fix those errors, um, d just double click them in the console right here. Open in your code editor of choice and one of them is for simple activator menu so it will say something like GUI text is obsolete just change it to text and import the unity engine.ui namespace here and in forced reset again import the same namespace and image right here so it would be GUI texture just change it to image and then the whole project will compile and you'll have no problems and you can get on with the requirements so the first requirement is spawning holes in the floor of the maze that the player can fall through and then subsequently will display the game over scene and then to the title screen from that. So first requirement is spawning the holes. So what I did for that, I, in the level generator class, I declared a public property here called holes to spawn. And when you gen um, declare a public property in a class in Unity, we go into the GUI here for the dungeon generator this is the class it will just expose itself in the properties here in the inspector so then because it's an integer we can use the slider to change the number of holes in the maze 
So we're just going to put, say, 6, for example. It doesn't really matter what we put. But the code, um, it takes in the number of holes, and then it will just generate them accordingly. So with that, um, and or in order to implement that even, um, what we're doing here was storing uh, a key value pair. So if you're not familiar with key value pair, it's just a pair of integers in this case. It could be a pair of strings, a pair of booleans. It, it doesn't really matter. So a key value uh, pair, this will store coordinates of the holes in the maze. So we want to plot three holes. It'll have something like 4, 2, 3, 1, 7, 6, uh, 112, 2. And it will only spawn the holes in walkable locations. So they're the corridors, they're not the walls. And with the holes, we don't want to spawn a pickup above a hole. And we don't want to spawn our player instantly over a hole. So this is why I sort of implemented it this way. And for each coordinate, right here, we're stuffing it into a list. Now, a list is just like an array in C Sharp, if you're not familiar. But with a list, we get a few extra methods um, you know, that comes with the list object. So we can use various methods here. If I just put a period there. We have a lot more things available to us. We can use link as well with the list. So it has a lot more control uh, over the objects in the list. But in terms of indexing and looping through, uh, very similar to just a standard array. Uh, but I, I tend to use lists for everything in C Sharp. And when we define our list, we're just saying we only want this many items in our list. So this is like a memory saving optional uh, parameter you can put here. So this will uh, declare a list and initialize it with a capacity of 3, for example. So this will contain all the coordinates for the holes that will be in our maze. Now we only want to put holes in walkable locations, uh, which I covered earlier. We don't want to put a hole under a wall, uh, under a pickup, or under our character initially. So what, what I did, I, I wrote a helper method called walkable locations. And this again will be a key value pair list of coordinates of everywhere in the maze where we're actually able to walk. And because it's a place we can walk, it's also a valid place we can plant a hole. So that's why this is here. And how this method is generated is this code right here. So this is a helper function. It gets all the coordinates of walkable locations in the maze. And to do that, when we generate our maze, it just comes as an input here. Um, right here, map data. So this already has the, the Boolean 2D array of everything in the maze where the ones are the walls and the, the zeros are the walkable locations. So it goes through the whole maze and when it finds a zero, so we're using not here, so when it's not true, uh, we just want to add it to our key value pair list which we return out of here. And this will contain all the coordinates, so you can see Z and X here, of all the locations we can walk. So that, that's all that does, that's how that works. And it just gets stuffed into an object called walkable locations. So we want three holes to spawn, so it's going to run this for loop here three times. And for each hole, it's going to generate a random index in our walkable locations object, which is here. So to generate a random number, uh, you can generate a random number in Unity, which did the lecture covered, or you can generate one in .NET, the C Sharp .NET framework. And that's just system.random. It doesn't really matter which one you use, I'm just used to this because I work with C Sharp quite a lot. And this part here is like the seed. This ensures we get a random number. And this is a really nice way of generating a random number in uh, C Sharp. So GUID.NewGUID, it just generates a random new GUID. It's like a unique identifier built into the framework. And getting the hash code just puts it in sort of like a format that uh, a random number seed can work with. So that's all that piece is here. And next is a method of the random class here that just generates our next random number. So it's a lower bounds inclusive, so it can include zero, and the upper bound non-inclusive, so that's just the length of our list, and this will be negative one implied on this. So that's just how we generate a random integer. And this will be an indexed location of our walkable locations list. So say if we have seven walkable locations in our maze, we're well not going to have hundreds, but say we have seven, it'll just generate a number between zero and six. So that's all that does, it's just an index. And then we loop, and the reason we put a loop here is 
because we don't want a hole on top of a hole. If we want three holes, it's implied we want three unique holes. We don't want two holes in the same location because then we're going to have two holes total. So that just loops through our walkable locations and our currently plotted holes and make sure, you know, it just makes sure that they, they are unique. So first requirement, make sure we haven't already got a hole at that coordinate. And also make sure a hole is never placed under a pickup and that's this line right here. So with the provided code, uh, how the pickup is uh, spawned is it takes the last location when we dig out a maze. So as we're digging out the maze, our little robot goes through the walls, carving out the walls, and when it's sort of done at the far corner, it plots a pickup. And how it does that, as it traverses through and digs out the walls, it uh, updates these maze x and maze y values. Uh, now this maze Y, it should really be maze uh, Z, maze Z, um, it's just called maze Y, I, I don't know, I guess they're working on X and Y in here, but um, the way the project is structured, we actually go on the X and Z axis, so a bit confusing why they called it that, but there it is. And so these two values are the coordinates where the pickup is located, so you can see right here. So we can just reuse those because now we know where the pickup is, we just want to make sure we don't spawn a hole there. So that's all that line does. So, however, if we're trying to spawn a hole under a pickup or a hole on a currently existing hole, we just want to generate a new random number because we don't want to do that. So that's what this while loop does. It keeps doing this until those conditions aren't met. And when we have a hole we want to plot, we just stuff it in hole locations. So that, that is, it's as simple as that. So the result of all this code here, it just generates as a coordinate list of hole locations. So now we know we have three holes in this list with coordinates given by integers. So that's all it does, it just sets this variable up so we can use it later. And how we tie into this, well I've just modified this code slightly here. I just want to draw a floor underneath the wall. Um, it's, it's kind of optional but I feel like there might be sort of like a glitch if you move the camera around you might see some sort of flashing um, if you have a space under a wall I just showed that there and that allows us uh, so this is when we're generating a wall here however if we're not generating a wall we're either generating a hole or a piece of corridor so that's the non-wall logic here so again, as I mentioned, this whole locations is a coordinate list of all the holes we want to plot. So if the current um, piece of maze we're generating, because it goes through the maze and generates it, if it doesn't match up to a coordinate hole location, then we just want to generate a floor tile. And um, because now we know there's not a hole here, we're also generating the character as well. So that's how we don't place a character above a hole. If this isn't um, satisfied, so we are now generating a hole, well we don't actually do anything because generating a hole is just not generating a floor tile. So this is this only satisfies when it's not a hole. So that's how hole locations ties into this. You can you can see all the compli complicated stuff is up here. When it ties in, you're literally just referring to it as a collection. And we're generating roof whatever happens because we can have a roof above a wall, above a corridor and above a hole. So that is how all that ties into it and how we can sort of dynamically generate uh, X number of holes in the maze. We're not just tying ourselves to three holes or seven holes. So it's kind of dynamic and flexible which is the purpose of the code here. So that's that requirement there. So the next uh, part of the requirement is the game over screen so that comes into unity itself here we'll go to the project and what I did I right click create a new scene right here call it whatever you want uh, I tend not to use white spaces in here I, I guess it doesn't really matter it's, it's, it's just my preference so I called it game over I opened up the title scene I copied all these items here and pasted them into the game over scene very simple if you're not copying the camera that, and you're just using the camera here, then just don't forget to change the clear flags to solid color because it's the skybox by default and also set the background to black. Uh, otherwise we get this skybox behind. So in the game over scene, we, um, as, we're copied, as we copied all these components here, 
we just want to change the text of this to game over because on the title scene it says dread 50 that's the only reason there and on the title screen if we click the uh, text object here there's a script associated with it which is load scene on input so from the title screen when we press enter which is this line right here it just loads the play scene and that's how we get into the game we don't want that behavior on the game over scene so we just modify it slightly so from here from the game over scene we want to load the title scene so I've just added a new script I've called it load title screen which is right here and I've associated it with this text component here so when we double click into it we can see a slight change of code here so this is a new class and I just when I press enter I want to load the title screen so that loops us back to the start of the game so that's yeah, pretty simple here yeah. so in order to trigger the game over screen so a bit more code now um, we want to detect player death so that's this class right here and this will detect the death of a player again with unity you don't really need much code at all because it's all nicely been done for you so in the scene itself we go to the play scene we click the FPS controller now the FPS controller is us that's our character that's who we are so this is the y-axis we need to work with so with the FPS controller we already have the grab pickup script associated with it so when our character um, meets the same coordinates of the pickup and that's how that works there it's linked with the FPS controller similarly um, we're creating a new script here with the FPS controller called player death and that's how we check for player death so if we go into here this is our player death now because we associated this script with the FPS controller the inbuilt object provided to us which is game object this is provided by the unity engine will equal the FPS controller so whenever we talk about game object in pl this player death class it will be the FPS controller here similarly if we associated this object to a text label then game object will always talk about the text label so this is the FPS controller it has a property called transform which subsequently has a property called position and then we're going to get the y-axis off that so if the y-axis is left less than zero so that indicates our player is lower than the floor we want to destroy the whisper source so that's the sound in the game currently so this uh, method is provided to us by unity it's called destroy takes in one parameter here in this case and that will be the object it destroys and because the whisper source belongs to a different class then we want to find out where that class is in the whole solution and get that whisper source so that's how you find an object in a different class from the class we're in and then we just destroy it so that's just going to kill the sound in the game uh, I'll come back to this line later, that's how we reset our level number back to 1 and then as before we load the game over um, scene which we've just created and that's how that all links together um, really easy actually when you sort of look at that <laughs> so when you add a scene into unity, this wasn't really covered go to file, then build settings and then scenes in build we need to add it to this list so what you can do here is just click this button and that will add our game over scene into this list and you can optionally click build if you want as well when we use the scene manager in the code which is this line right here we can use the name of our scene or we can use one of these indexes right here I prefer to use the name of the scene as indexes can always get shuffled around later on now the reason this list probably exists, I'm just sort of guessing here, is that if you have a test scene, so you want to test things around, um, but when you actually release your game, you don't want this test scene in the game, you don't want the public to see it. And I think that's why you can sort of uncheck them there. So yeah, um, and if you don't do that, you will get an error, and you um, and the solution will fall over on this line it can't find the scene because it's not in your build settings so that's something I sort of discovered when doing this assignment uh, so that's how all that uh, sort of links together and we check for death and load the game over screen so the last item is adding the text label to the play scene uh, which indicates the current level that you're on so the third requirement so if you open the play scene here 
right click UI and we want a text label now in unity it seems that any of these UI components cannot live without a canvas if you create the text it'll automatically create a canvas and um, sort of make it the parent of the text so the text we just created I called it level number again all one word I suppose it doesn't really matter and from this, I, I, I copied the text from the title screen just so we have the same font so it's uh, consistent. I anchored it, which you can do here. I anchored it in the bottom left corner. So if you're using an iPhone, an Android, a huge 70 inch TV, it'll always appear in the bottom corner and not sort of scale weirdly. Uh, make the text box wide enough so if you have a two or three digit level number uh, you know god knows if you want to play a hundred levels that it doesn't get truncated off at that point so that's why it's a little wider there and uh, the bit I found most confusing isn't it isn't the code it was sort of how this 2d canvas sort of uh, lives with the 3d world I didn't really understand how that worked I, I was thinking I'm going to add this text, then where the hell is it going to be in my maze, you know, <laughs> do I have to find it? But how this seems to work is when you create a, a text ob uh, object and it subsequently creates a canvas, it overlays the whole thing uh, over your screen, so it's like looking through it, like a looking glass into the game. So that's sort of how that seems to work, and I couldn't wrap my head around it at first, but uh, it, it, I suppose it sort of makes sense. Um, so when you create a 2D canvas on a 3D world, it is, imagine it just, this is your screen and it's like a looking glass, so your game will be sort of behind here. So yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, it, it didn't really make sense to me, but that's how it sort of works anyway. Um, so yeah, we've added the text and what we want to do now is uh, modify some of the code to display the level number. So that's in grabpickups.cs, uh, this is the file here. I've created a static variable here. Um, now, a static variable in object-oriented programming, uh, if it's a static member of a class, then we uh, use the static um, variable by prefixing it with the class name. It's on class level. Um, so if we go into player death, you can see we just prefix the static variable with the, with the class itself. Normally, if it's not static, you instantiate the class by doing grab pickups equals new whatever, then you access the variable from the instance of the class. But because it's static, that's how it works in object oriented programming. But in terms of unity, a static variable doesn't live with the scene. We can load a new scene and come back to the old scene, and our static variable will still persist. So if it has the value of 3, we sort of dispose of the scene I guess and load up the, the play one and uh, come back to it and it'll still equal three so that's sort of how unity uses that uh, this uh, property here is a, a text property which lives in the UI library of the unity engine and this will just sort of set the text uh, from a user perspective how they see the level number so when we call this awake here I believe this just gets called once when we sort of load the, the scene it's associated with and it just sets uh, the text of that label to level colon white space and then the current level number and this just gets updated every time we sort of load the scene associated with this script and this is when we pick up a pickup we want to increase the level number so we're just increasing the static variable by one it's denoted by the plus plus here and then this is the code as before and when we you know have the player death we want to reset this back to one and again if this isn't static we wouldn't need to do this but then again it wouldn't persist with scene changes anyway so that's sort of why we have to do that here so yeah that's how we display the level numbers on on a label we we're anchoring it to the bottom left and how we reset it back to one when we get game over so I believe, yeah, that is everything really. So yeah, holes in the floor, which are dynamically changeable, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, getting the game over screen, cutting out the music, uh, starting again, and also displaying and resetting uh, level numbers. So I hope this helped you, and uh, good luck with your project. It was, it was quite a fun one this time around.